three, two, one. Welcome back to another episode of Digital Voices with Bo Tiffany. We talk about what's on our hearts, what's on our minds, and we talk interesting people. Everybody has a story and everybody has a journey that's gotten them there. It's given us tools and insight along the way that's helped us as we've gone to next chapters in our life. My guest today is State Representative Christine Snicky, and Christine has been serving our state for over 21 years as our State Representative Democratic Party. The work that she's done to transform some of the issues in our state has been invaluable. Uh, my journey uh, connecting with her has been long. Um, my own story is what connected us, and um, I've been nothing but thankful and and um, have profound respect for the efforts that you made uh, in our state thus far. And so with that said, Christine, thank you, thank you for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me. So... Tell us a little bit about yourself. You're originally from Wisconsin. Born and raised in Bayview, in Milwaukee. And I live in the same uh, neighborhood that I grew up in. Oh, how wonderful. So you've seen a lot of changes over 40 years? Does it stay the same in your neighborhood? Oh, gosh. Yeah, a lot of changes. Um, we especially, I would say the last 10 to 15 years, um, we have a lot of new younger families coming into Bayview. Um, you know, a lot of the, the elderly are now either moving into, you know, assisted living or we're losing them. And so our neighbor, the neighborhoods now are really becoming filled with young families, young children, which I just love. I love looking out my window and seeing all the kids playing on my street. <laughs> so. Now you started out in your career at Wisconsin as the president of the Parent Teachers Association uh, in the Milwaukee area, correct? Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I was raised, you know, I, my mother raised five girls. Um, and she raised us all to give back to our community. I went, my children went to school, the same grade school I went to, and that's the same grade school in which my mother was the PTA president. So when I got involved in the school, it was like a no-brainer for people. I became the PTA president. Um, it taught me a lot. Uh, I'm grateful for the experience that I, experience I had with that. It uh, really taught me, um, you know, to speak in public and just, you know, be comfortable with actually being an activist. Right. So. Now, you said your mom started that way, too? She was also president of the yeah. PTA? Yeah, my mother was uh, a very well-known education activist in Milwaukee, uh, Mary Morris. Um, yeah, she got her start as well um, as a PTA president and moved up through the ranks. Um, she was actually on the national PTA board for a while, I believe, but I don't know how long for. Um, but yeah, she's um, she was very well known. You know, when when I um, got elected school board, she was on. She was at every school board meeting and I'll never forget the story one time she was speaking and I wanted to ask a question so instead of saying Mrs. Morris I said hey mom <laughs> it was pretty it was, it was pretty comical <laughs> civil service has been part of your family your whole life um, oh absolutely I got two sisters that are teachers another one works in the nonprofit arena unfortunately I lost my oldest sister who was also um an activist about 15 years ago in a car accident. Oh gosh, it's, you know, 16 years tomorrow. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for your service. I think um, yeah. it's a hell of a thing to be a civil service these days. Um, <laughs> how has, I mean, from starting the job, coming into it as, you know, the um, president of the PTA board, it's got to be a night and day difference. Um, was there a learning curve for you? How hard was it to kind of jump into that role? Oh, gosh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, before I went to legislature, I did spend eight years on the Milwaukee School Board. And I was, you know, I mean, when you go from something like a school board, which is very small in body, and then you go into something like the state assembly where you've got 99 people that, you know, that you're dealing with, it's, it's a huge learning curve. It probably took me at least the first year 
to get at, actually get comfortable um, speaking in the chamber. Um, it's because as somebody who has been involved all these years, I looked around that room and I saw the names and faces of people that I, you know, grew up hearing about. You know, people from Milwaukee that had been activists and working on these issues for years and years. Mm -hmm. And I was now their colleague. And I, I was kind of like, it was, it was, it was a learning curve and I was extremely nervous at that time. So when the connections and the people that you've met, um, does it take a while to develop relationships in order to work cooperatively in legislation? Um, yeah, you know, it does. Um, you know, when I was first elected, there was an attitude actually among senior members. You know, they didn't really talk to the little freshmen too much because they wanted to make sure that you were going to be able to cut it and you're going to stick around for a while right. before they, you know, got to know you, got working with you. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, like a sorority almost. It's like, okay, you got to, you know, you got to pay your dues and get your feet wet and prove yourself before anything else. Um, but, but now I, you know, I work across the aisle with both sides, but, you know, um, one of the good things about a citizen legislature is we all have different experiences and we're able to share those experiences. Mm -hmm. So that's really helpful. The people that you've met along the way too, um, Sometimes I feel like the way that I met you, obviously reaching out when I was going through hard times of my own, um, yeah. you must get a ton of that. <laughs> Is it a little inundating? It, it can be, yes. Um, you know, when I was first elected, I a third of my district is the area I grew up in, so it's fine there. Then I also um, was representing two suburbs as well, where I, nobody knew me. I had no connections there. Um, but I worked, I've been, I worked really hard to uh, get involved in those communities. And, you know, now nobody has a chance to call me. I'm like, you know, their next door neighbor. And, you know, the other thing that, that happens quite often, which is my, my staff sometimes is like, oh, gosh. People will call the office and say, well, I'm her cousin. Or I went to school with her. I need her help. And <laughs> this is a kind of a funny story. I have three stepsisters. I'm not, we're not close. They're all older than me and they live up north. And I'll sit, I got a call from my, from Mary Beth, my aide in my office. And she's whispering and she says, there's, there's somebody here pretending to be your stepsister. I said, is her name Jan? She said, yeah. I said, she is my stepsister. It's okay. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so, you know, it's, I've gotten to know a lot of new people, new friends. Uh, but, you know, my old friends still, you know, they, they remember me from our high school years, and they will call um, and use that connection, which I don't mind at sure. all. Um, but, you know, that's what I do. I, I, that's, this is the reason why I went into public service, was to be able to help people. Well, you're being a state representative, you're kind of the frontline contact with, the public, right? Um, yeah. Um, most people are going to call their state representative before they call their senator. Um, I think it's just because the way our legislature is set up, um, the state assembly is known as the people's house. We run every two years. The Senate is every four years. So, for people that have to run every two years, you are always constantly out there in the public talking with people. It's almost like a nonstop campaign. Mm -hmm. So people get to know their state representative, I think, better than their state senator. And they feel comfortable calling. What is your primary job as a state representative? What's the primary function that you... <laughs> yeah, it's a, um, I, I guess the primary job is to, uh, um, you know, work on policies and passing laws that that uh, support the people of the state of Wisconsin. 
Um, it's not my favorite part of the job. I would, you know, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, that, that's the main part of the job, but my favorite part of the job is actually just uh, working in the district, uh, talking with people. Um, you know, I, I guess you got to take the good with the bad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some, the flags that you see within the community are are first spotted by you in your office, or at least our representatives within right. our district. Um, and, and I think that's important. Um, you know, reaching mm-hmm. out to you, there's cracks in the system that I found um, in my own journey that until you're going through it, you're not aware that they exist. And Trying to find help um, in some of those given situations is really difficult because there aren't an agency or some of the legislature seems set up to protect maybe more of the elite than it is some of the people, which then gets frustrating, too. And I know that one of your jobs is trying to keep a check and balances in that aspect. Um, One of the things that I've been frustrated on, and I'm sure you, too, is when a bill comes out, there's often other legislation that are snuck into it and conditional to Mm -hmm. passing a bill, which often are counterproductive to, you know, representing the people. Um, I know that yourself, there's been some fights that you've been fighting for your whole career, um, that are difficult to make changes in. Um, I think public health and health care, um, is maybe Mm -hmm. a great example of that. Are there other examples that you've really had a difficult time trying to make change in? Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm going to be very partisan here. I hope you don't mind. No, absolutely. <laughs> okay. When when I was first elected, we had a legislature. We had um, uh, what I would call normal Republicans. Um, moderate Republicans, Republicans that you could work with and get stuff done. Over the past 10 years, I would say probably since Act 10, um, that that has shifted. The moderates um, have left. And now we've got um, all the ultra-conservative um, Republicans. And it's... And, it is very difficult to get them to support the issues that I'm interested in. For instance, one of my very first bills, and, I, and I, I'm i still working on it, um, I'm very tenacious, <laughs> was <laughs> is uh, equal pay for women and minorities. I mean, it, to me, it's a no-brainer. Right. I mean, you do the same job, you should get, you know, you have the same education, you get the same pay. Uh, I've been fighting this fight for 20 years. It actually became was signed into law. It was law for two years, and then when the Republicans came back and took over, it was repealed. I see that happen uh, a lot. They, they, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It was like okay, I just lost like you know 10 years of my life's work here. Right. Um. But so every session, we redraft it and we reintroduce it. Um, I'll be doing that probably within the next month. Um, you know, I do think that as as legislative members, I think we all want the same thing, but we have different ways of getting at it. Does that make sense? Sure. And yeah, I just um, yeah, I guess that's how I would explain it. I, and um. Yeah, I don't know. That's how I would explain it. You just have different ways of trying to get at it. So you think that, and the other, you think that the goals are the same across party lines. It's just the way that you try to achieve it that's different. Is that what you're? I think so. I honestly think so. Unless, I mean, I mean, I am. I've become a little cynical over the years. I, I will admit. Um. But I, I would hope we, we all want the same goals. Um, the the Republicans talk a good talk that you know they want to do good stuff for the people of Wisconsin, mm-hmm. but then when they come out with how they're going to get there, I just kind of shake my head and go, "Do these people like stay up all night thinking this stuff up?" 
I mean, I don't know where they get these ideas from. <laughs> I it floors me sometimes. Um, there's a so I mean that would be my hope. <laughs> there's a, a civil distrust, I think, currently, and I hope yeah. that I hope that yeah. you guys are aware of that. Um, oh yeah, and, yeah. and it's been eroding over time, and yeah, it, it has been. the The largest part for me um, that's really been a spark to this whole cinder pile has been the amount of fake news and misinformation. And depending on what network you're listening to, whether it's Fox or CNN or what have you, Mm -hmm. there's a different narrative behind each story and a different twist in a way that they Mm -hmm. try to portray it. Right. My, my own community, I live in Sheboygan, Wisconsin now, um, Uh grew up in Madison, Madison's mentality and thought processing is a lot different than where I live now. And in my yeah. area, <laughs> uh, a lot of Republican supporters, um, and they're all smart people that I know. And it's been very tenuous on relationships, having political discussions in the last few years, just because <laughs> yeah. it's almost like uh, religion and politics. You can't talk it in anywhere these days because it just starts to yeah. create uh some opinionations. Yeah. So the, um, yeah, yeah. I actually, I actually had to uh, cut a cousin of mine out of my life. He's always been very close and I just couldn't deal with him anymore because of the, you know, of his support of all the conspiracy theories and that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. I was like, I just can't deal with this. <laughs> Have you seen uh, like the great hack? That was a Netflix documentary on Cambridge Analytica and, and the, um, some of the misinformation and the tools that, that they're using now to spread that misinformation. No, I haven't. That's a, a really great documentary to watch. I'd highly recommend that one. Um, oh yeah, I'm pretty happy. The, the problem that I see is so, um, that's, I'm really surprised that you don't know about it. Um, so what they, what they've done is platforms like Facebook and Twitter and, and all of our social medias and, mm-hmm. they have over 5,000 different data set points on each individual uh person in the world and they've now been able to target market ads to try to buy votes or or try to persuade people in political right um, along with other arenas and so i think that the drive behind a lot of the misinformation that we're seeing has a lot to do with that um, especially if you take a look at some of russia's involvement and some of the targeted misinformation that they've been doing to try to sway, you know, especially the last election and some of the involvement yeah. that they've had with this one. But I think that yeah. some of the dis- civil discord um, is coming from that because people just don't know what to believe and in censoring or, or trying to find fact checking sites that, you know, you have to spend a lot of time and a lot of people are, are really busy in their life and they don't have that. Right. That drive to try to fact check every single yeah. piece. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> um, that's very true. Have you seen a lot of change? Uh, I mean, obviously, you're not really as familiar with Cambridge Analytic, um, but in terms of misinformation and in terms of just some of the stuff that you're seeing out there, um, has there been an increase in in some of the crazy stuff that you're seeing, at least? Uh yeah, um, especially since this last election. Um, we received, I don't even know how many, thousands and thousands of emails from not only around the country here, but around the world. Basically, you know, um, accusing me and everybody else, just Democrats, of, you know, uh, voter fraud, you know, suing the election. Um, just off the wall, some of it has been threatening. Um, you know, I just think people with, with what people are exposed to now with, you know, the internet and all these conspiracy sites and, Mm -hmm. um, it's just, I think almost like they are being, um, brainwashed. I don't know. I don't, I, you know, I, I just cannot. No, you hit it on the head. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. going to send you a link to that 
that documentary. Okay. I would be honored yeah, be if, you, great. if you watched it. That would be great. You know, I got one letter. It went to everybody in the legislature, and it it was it was actually hilarious. I'm like, what is wrong with these people? Um, she goes, she um, uh, let's see if I can. I don't know if I even have it anymore. But she basically says that uh, the left is going to take over, and Dr. Joe Biden is going to be running the country while Joe Biden sits in his basement rubbing his hairy legs. Well, my first reaction was, how does the person know that Joe Biden has hairy legs? I mean, it was just, Some of that fake it, news that I was is, talking about. So part of yeah. part of what they were releasing this last year was... Uh, a comment that Biden had made about the way that the sun reflects off his legs when, you know, with the hair uh-huh. and such in Florida, it was just the context <laughs> and the certain things that they reach out. It's kind of like they played that along with the uh, narratives of him sniffing women's hair and acting creepy oh. within certain clips. I'm sure you've seen some of those that have been circulating. Oh yeah. You know, yeah. and that's, yeah. That's, again, what starts to feed that mistrust. So most people, and I want to, I'm a Democrat, and my friends hate me Mm -hmm. for it. (laughs) Oh, yeah, I got got some of those. (laughs) And and I look at them, and I don't understand, and they're very intelligent people. We both are. And Mm -hmm. the fact that we see things so differently sometimes, and a lot of that has to do with where they're getting their news, or they might say the same to me. But Yeah, it's. Are Democrats right. evil? <laughs> what's what's your what's your response to that? No. How, how do we well, save the fact, party? The, re- the reason why I cut my cousin out of my life is because he called me evil. Mm. Um, you know, I don't think our party needs saving. I, you know, I do think that there are some. You know, we we have to work on you know um, showing people what who we are and what what we can actually do. You know, when when they, when those, um, when the Atlanta election, the Georgia election, when we won those two seats, my first thought was, okay, you need to be bold now. You need to take control and show people that as Democrats, we can get the work done. Um, I think the Republican Party that needs saving at this point in time. Um, I I think we've got a very strong backbone in our party, our party and I think uh, the next few years are going to prove that. Um, I mean, I just I don't think I don't think we need saving. I really don't. I think we are on the right side of history. We're on the right side of of you know every issue, hmm. as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. So, and you know, as long as you can, I just say one more thing about yeah. um, the president-elect. So I am so tired of people attacking him for being creepy or you know a pedophile or mm-hmm. having dementia. Mm-hmm. I've had the privilege of meeting Joe Biden on several occasions. He is. I mean, I've always been very impressed with his openness, his integrity. And um, the last time that I uh, was, I saw him, it was when my niece was going to uh, brain cancer treatment. And, you know, she heard he was coming to walk and she asked me if I was going and if I could take a letter for her. I said, sure. But then I thought, wait a minute. I'm Chris Sadicki. I can do better than this. <laughs> so I made arrangements for Andy to go with me and meet Joe Biden. He gave her a personal phone number in case she wanted to talk. And to this day, he still carries her picture on his phone. Wow. Um, it's, uh, to me, that's who I want as a president. Right. Someone who actually cares about people. One of the other things that I've been hearing, and I'd be remiss if I didn't ask and take some of the opportunity to discuss it. Obviously, we have what just happened in D.C. with 
the riot that was really incited yeah. by Trump. And that's my opinion. I'm yeah. sure a lot of others share that. Um, mm-hmm. People are divided in this country. It was a really close election, much closer than I would have thought it was considering the last four years and how I viewed that. Yeah. The, um, what we're seeing now is, you know, the Trump supporters think it was stolen and it was a lar- in large part because of the misinformation and the things that Trump is saying that's completely yeah. not true. Um, again, right. That was the first time the Capitol building's been, you know, even broken into since 1814, I think is what I saw. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, so. th- this is 2021. These are uh, actions that are, they speak loudly to most of us. Mm-hmm. Um, how are we going to, what's the next four years going to look like? How are we going to start salvaging the relationship with the people so that the trust is regained? That is a really good question. Um, And as you said, this country is divided, and it's even more divided since the election because of, um, you know, the accusation of election fraud and voter fraud and, um, you know, hiding ballots and destroying ballots. You know, I have been involved in electoral politics for 30 years. I can tell you right now, this was the safest run election I think that we've ever had because we knew there were going to be accusations like this. Um, so every municipal clerk, every, you know, it was everything was done to a T correctly. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and then when you've got the losing, the, you know, the president who obviously, um, lost and to start putting ideas like this in people's heads they're like cult members I mean it's like oh yeah Trump told me this so it's true um yeah we we're gonna have to really work hard to now regain the trust of a large segment of this community um I don't know if, if people are you know some of these people are even gonna trust our electoral system anymore mm-hmm because there's been such, I mean, it's, it's, you know, they've got this in their head now. And um, I don't know how we do it, but we got to because I'm really worried people are just going to, you know, say, oh, you know what? I'm not even going to vote because it's, it's, you know, all a hoax anywhere. So, you know, it's a dumb deal. Why should I bother voting? You know, the DNC is going to, you know, make sure that their candidate wins. Well, what is the iron feed? You know, it's, it's, it's going to be tough. I don't know. I don't know how we do it, but it's got to start at the federal level and it's got to start with the newly elected president. And I've got faith that he's going to uh, really work to bring this this country back together. I think uh, one of the things that would go a long way for me is watching people work Mm -hmm. together and what we've seen, you know, even if we go back, previous to the last four years, looking at the Obama mm-hmm. administration, I watched Obama come in in the first, first four years, especially mm-hmm. the Republicans didn't want to work with them and right. really blocked a lot of the measures that they were trying to get through. The second four years, he was mm-hmm. more successful, but they still played the same game. Right. The two-party system, for what I hear a lot within my community, seems to be broken because now it's a revolving door. He passed this this year or this this particular four years. Next four years, we're going to repeal it. So instead of actually making progress, we end up stalemating, which I feel is mm-hmm. kind of why you end up fighting some of the battles that you've been fighting for so long. Do you? Mm-hmm. See, am I wrong in that, or is that a good analogy of what's mm-hmm. going on? Well, you know, it's probably a very good analogy. Um you know, I don't, I don't understand. I, I don't know the exact process for actually having a new party actually recognized, you know, and put on the ballot and that kind of stuff. I, I don't know. I'll be honest with you. I don't know how any of that works. Sure. Um, but I think there is a group, there is a group of people, moderates, right down the middle of each party who are fed up 
with the extreme end of the party. Mm-hmm. Um, and they they want they want a party that they can believe in. They want a party that you know they can be proud of. Um, I mean, I'm proud of my Democratic Party. I think you know we've done a lot. But like I said, there's a, the moderates. There's a lot of moderates who um, who would love to have another party to vote for, and. Maybe someday down the road that's going to happen. I don't know. You know, I'm 60 years old. I don't know if it will happen in my lifetime. Sure. But we have to get away from the extremists. It's just... Well, we have, to fix, we have to fix the revolving door. And however that yeah. happens, whether that's adding a, an additional party or... Yeah. I know that there's, yeah. we're technically a three-party system, but the third party doesn't get federal funding for election. And most of the people that are running for that particular slot don't get much of the mm-hmm. vote and right so there's got to be another way to fix this um yeah the other issue that has come up with this last election is age limits on certain things and the focus on like career politicians um i personally like <laughs> i love the fact that you've been serving as long as you have because you've done a lot of good for us i've seen the, the work that you've done um but some of the people that I've seen in our legislature really seem to to block a lot of roads. Um, I know mm-hmm. that I, I've, you know, especially looking at the House and the Senate, uh, Mitch McConnell um, and the the fight that that's had within the party versus Democrats and just this opposition of working together. Um, something's got to change and on a civil aspect, it seems we're all freaking out (laughs) as a people. Um, and, and we have to trust and we have all this misinformation and all of this pretty radical stuff that's out there that also feeds into our daily news cycle. Um, Mm -hmm. again, how can we find a sense of normality in our times? Cause that's, really important for the mental health aspect too of our society. And if we, we can't trust and we're going through a pandemic and we we're thinking the vaccines are going to kill us or hurt us. And, you know, there's just, a, there's so much out there. Um, how yeah. do we, how do we start at least making baby steps towards uh, trust and cooperation? You know, I would hope I mean, Wednesday, this past Wednesday, um, was, how do I want to put this, a turning point, maybe? Um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be like, just a horrible stain on our democracy. Yeah. But I, I would hope that that could be used as a turning point. And as a teaching tool, right. Um, I don't know if that will truly happen. I mean, I'm hearing rhetoric on both sides that you know we all need to work together now. Blah blah blah. Well, you know, I've seen this before. I've seen this with gun issues. I've mm-hmm. seen it. You know, you know, we all need to work together to to you know do something about the guns and and you know. We'll talk like that for one or two weeks, and then it's out of everybody's mind again. Mm-hmm. And we're back to the same old stuff. I would hope what happened on Wednesday, this, this blatant attack on our democracy, is enough to make people understand that, you know, this is what happened. Yes, it's, it's Trump's fault, but it's also everybody's fault. I mean, our fault, too, because we did nothing to stop him. Number one, number two, it's you know the other side's fault because they did nothing but encourage him. Well, I feel like Trump so, was was an option for the people that wanted to get rid of traditional politics. Things have been going bad for so many years that he was a at least a breath of fresh air that we all had an expectation it would change the system. However, in my opinion, which is what I started with. Um, you can't put someone that has a history of being corrupt in a position of trying to make mm-hmm. world change because 
a right. tiger doesn't change his stripes, you know, and, and the last four years just proved that it was a continuation of how he's been his whole life. And yeah, you know, you're actually right. So that, that's where I get frustrated. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, we need, we need to work together, but I think one of the things that, that I also see that I think resounds within our communities is a sense that lobbyist, big business and 1% elite tend to rule the country. And so, you know, in terms of, of, uh, buying off our political, uh, representatives or, or what have you, there's a lot of mistrust Mm -hmm. because we see, again, talking about legislature and sneaking certain things Mm -hmm. in to go along with that as a condition just to pass a bill. I mean, I can't really talk, uh, you know, the congressional level. Mm -hmm. I'm not there to see how they operate, you know, on some of the stuff. But what I can tell you is in the legislature, there are, I would really have to say money is the most powerful thing. I mean, I have seen bills, great bills get killed because of campaign money. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen good bills, you know, be killed because, you know, of lobbyists. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I have one particular bill, which I think we're going to talk about next time, which is, you know, the, the uh, medical errors bill. Mm-hmm. It's a great bill. It, it's, it's, it helps everybody. It helps the doctors, help, but, you know, help patients, help families. But you know what? The hospital association gives so much money for campaigns that nobody wants anger them right you, you brought it's up just, a, you, you hit the point <laughs> for me yeah, I, let me can i let me ask you a couple of things so I've, mm-hmm, I, yeah. I, I've i've learned so much in my own journey of the last four years um steve burroughs has become not only a friend but also someone mm-hmm. that's inspired me to start my podcast um you and the work that you've done Helping his mom and his situation have mm-hmm. also introduced me to some people like Wade Ayers and others that have been medical champions trying to fight this for quite a while now. And right. it's been a frustrating uphill battle that that really has just cost them more time and frustration than actually making good ground. Except for maybe Steve. I think there's a culture movement within healthcare yeah. for transparency and accountability that really is being fueled by the stand with unity movement. Um, yeah. But the, the issues that I see, especially when it comes to healthcare are a couple. Um, one is HIPAA. HIPAA was supposed to be the health information portability act, which mm-hmm. was going to make everything digital. There's a push to get rid of paper. It was supposed to be a good seamless system. However, right. there's not a standard for that. And so as a result, there's interoperability issues. In our state, we have right. we have a company that is a, a billion-dollar-plus company that actually creates software customized per hospital that holds over 200 million. I'm sorry, Bo, you, you, yeah. you cut out there a little bit. Oh, I'm well, sorry. I'm sorry. I, okay. I, I was saying that in our state, we have a, a company that actually – manufacturers or create software customized for healthcare record systems. And right. there's not a, because there's not a standard it's customized per hospital, but it's well known mm-hmm. for interoperability issues. Now the issue is, is that you have, you know, HIPAA, which you think would protect us as a citizen for the laws that are in place to protect our healthcare records and, and, the transferability of that. The problem Mm -hmm. is, is for a private citizen, you can't sue for HIPAA. So in my particular, in my particular situation, my, my frustration was that instead of having, um, a recourse when, when I had things go wrong with my healthcare records, it became something that I couldn't even address nor find someone to address. And there's a large, hole there that 
a lot of different things are occurring, um, but it's it's one that needs to get fixed um, because in my particular situation, not that I'm trying to start my story, but I had major legal editing of the records, a HIM administrator that said you need to find an attorney, but not being able to find anyone to represent it. Yeah. So the, the HIPAA aspect I just bring up because that's such a large loophole that needs to get fixed. The other aspect of, of the healthcare part of this is this transparency and accountability. Um, there's really no agency out there that can help anyone stuck in a medical malpractice in our state. And the right. injured patient compensation fund, which should be for someone like myself or another injured victim, ends up just mm-hmm. supplying the cost for the medical legal fees for the hospital. So they have this unlimited yep. fund. But that same uh, that same ability to access that fund isn't isn't available to the victim himself. And so right. you know, finding someone on either contingency or having to come up with money to find a representative, uh, you know, attorney wise to represent your case is, is nearly impossible. Right. So um, there's just some there's some large issues when it comes to health care um, aspect of it. And when you're talking about the lobbyists and you're talking about coming up with um, or having to fight some of these issues and money being as important as it is, there's mm-hmm. uh, there's been things that have been kind of snuck in um, via legislation, uh, you know, that I've been made aware of over the course of the last 10 years or more that have prohibited justice, you know, or it's, it's helped to protect these entities. Now, my question is, how is that happening? Um, why is it happening? Obviously the money aspect of it, but where at a certain line, I would think that ethics, morals come into place rather than, than just the almighty dollar. Um, how is this happening as a, as a culture, because this is happening in every state and as well as internationally. I'm just, I'm confused about that. Yeah. yeah I, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm long winded. <laughs> um, no, that's okay. That's okay. Um, Oh, I have an attorney friend calling me, but I'm just going to text real quick. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. Um, um, now I lost my train of thought. Um, the reason it's happening is like I said, you know, over the past 10, 15, 20 years, you've seen a shift in the legislature um, um, to more extreme on each side. And let's be honest, the Republican Party is not there to help you or me or Wade Air or Steve Burroughs. Their main, they are there to help whoever to give them the most money. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as we, as I've been working on the medical records bill, I'm sorry, the, um, um, I, I, I just forgot what I say it again. It happens when you get to be 61 years old, Joe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the medical errors bill. Now, I think this session will be the fourth time I'm going to introduce it, if I'm correct. And each time that it's introduced, we learn more that needs to be put into the bill. Mm-hmm. And so your issues here, I mean, the HIPAA one is that's going to be a federal issue. Um, but I want to invite you to join. Um, I'm hoping that Wade and Steve and I, the next couple of weeks, are going to do some type of Zoom call. Um, and just sit down and figure out what needs to be, you know, if we need to make some changes and should we add stuff, take some up, take some up. I'd like to ask you to join us. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, I'd be honored. Because that's how legislation is done. Um, you know, I don't sit home and dream up this stuff. Right. I get it from people, people who have experienced this stuff in their life. Mm-hmm. So that's how we can make change. And I'm hoping we're introducing it early enough this time 
that we can really push to at least get a hearing on it. The awareness, I think, is there. Um, the The issue is some of the things that come along with the issues that we have that I think Steve's documentary Bleed Out really addressed well, at least within our state. Um, mm-hmm. And some of those loopholes, if you will, um, that, you know, like HIPAA and, and some of the things that Steve addressed, if we could start knocking out some of those loopholes, I think that would go a long way. Um, yeah. I wish yep. that we had some ability, which will never happen, but to have some kind of ethics clause within our legislature. You know, if it's if the public... Uh, would deem this to be unethical, then then you should too. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that, right. yeah. that'll never happen. But there, no. needs to, there needs to be something, I think, that starts to steer us in, in society towards a place of cooperation, honesty, um, and quite frankly, looking out for the general public rather than just the people with the money. Because that turns right. us from a democracy into something that, that we were trying to get rid of in, in the first place. Right, um, right. No, I, you know, I, I echo exactly what you said. But like I said, is this going to happen in my lifetime? I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully my my grandkids will grow up in a much fairer ethical Wisconsin. Like I guess that's that's the only thing I can say and hope for at this point. Yeah. Um. Um. Well, all we can do is is vote in and and try to make discourse like we are now um the way that you the way that you've lived your life i think is proof in the pudding of how you walk through your job in life um you came from 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 a hometown in wisconsin you haven't left that you have a sense of community that probably no one else comes close to um most of us have not stayed in our same community that we grew up in and um so yeah, I, th- I think that's that's important, and having that tie to community, you. yeah. Um, for me, that put a lot of trust in you, and I've watched how crazy you've been um, this last <laughs> this last year, especially has been trying. Um, you've had so many different things that have come up that you've had to to really address, and this pandemic is is one of them. And I'd be remiss if yeah. I didn't if I didn't ask a little bit about it. Um, so mm-hmm. we have we have this pandemic. Um, we have you know some of the highest rates of infection and death since the pandemic began. Um, with the vaccines and and some of the other things that are starting to roll out, there's a sense that we're going to start getting over this hump. But then we've seen issues with uh, distribution of vaccines and, and other things. Mm-hmm. On your end of things, how are things looking for us going into 2021? Are we going to get a handle on this? Well, I, you know, I truly hope so because, um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously very extroverted uh, and, you know, staying away from people and, you know, it's really making me crazy. Mm. Um, put that out there. I, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, um, you know, now as a legislature, we don't have any input into how the vaccine is going to be rolled out. Mm-hmm. Even though Robin Boss, the speaker of our assembly, thinks that we should be able to decide who's going to get the vaccine. No, I don't want to, you know, it's like, no, I, it's not our job. Right. Um, we asked, you know, our, when this hit, was it March when it really hit full force? Yeah, mid March. Um, since then, we have been asking to be to go back in the session all summer long all special session and do what needs to be done for the people of Wisconsin um, I mean people were struggling and they still are um, Republicans refused to go into session and take it up Republicans you know they refused to take it seriously I and mean, they won't promote mask wearing. We won't promote social distancing. Um, you know, it's almost like, okay, every man for himself now. Mm-hmm. Um, 
they introduced a COVID relief bill oh, what's it, Monday. Oh, no, last week. Um, that does absolutely nothing for working families and the people. Um, it basically protects corporations for immunity. Um, it forces state workers and others back to work, even if, you know, there's no way they should be going back to work because of underlying health conditions. Um, it's just, it's a joke. It's a complete and utter joke. Um, you know, we introduced ours on Monday. Um, and what ours, ours, goes much, much further than theirs. I mean, we extend unemployment insurance benefits. We, you know, um, we have money for for our frontline healthcare workers who, you know, um, hazard pay, um, PPE, all that kind of stuff. Here we are nine months later and we're in worse shape than we were when this started. Right. Um, we have people who Every single day, my staff does nothing but basically work with, with people who are on the brink of losing their home, mm-hmm. financial ruin, do no fault of their own. Right. And The I, stimulus it, that it, they just released, <laughs> in my opinion, was disappointing too. Americans oh, have been yeah. out of work for nine plus months and, and then finally $600. It, I mean that six hundred dollars. Yeah, when yeah. you're losing your home yeah, well, and, and you're, you know, yeah. you've lost your business. Yeah, it doesn't go very and, far. You know, and then when you look at some of our our small businesses, particularly restaurants, mm-hmm. they're not going to survive this a lot, and they're not going to survive the winter. Right. We need to. We need to. You know, give uh, funds some help for them. It's just. It's. I don't know. Um, you know, there's a light in the tunnel. And I don't know when we're going to get the end of that tunnel, but I just, I, you know, I just pray everybody still follows the guidelines, stay safe, wear masks, social distances, and, you know, we get through this, hopefully by sometime this summer. What can we do as listeners, as members of our community, to offer support for some of these changes? Um. You can call your legislators. Uh, you can email your leg, contact your legislators, email, call, whatever, you know, um, tell, tell your story to them. Tell them how this is affecting you. Don't be ashamed to say, well, you know, I'm about to lose my house. Don't be ashamed to say that because it's not your fault. And, you know, there have been some people that, that my office has been able to, to help out with, with, you know, preventing that from happening. There's programs available um, that uh, that we can we can you know hook you up with. Um, but just put pressure on your legislators to do the right thing. They need to hear from you. You know, and, and also community service. I think you know if we can reach out to our legislators, that's one positive step because it raises awareness. But I've yeah. been a big fan of oh. the pay it forward within our communities and helping our neighbors yes. individually. Um, I think that's an important step for all of us yeah. listening. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah, over the holidays, and this should be an ongoing thing. Um, you know, I always do like a little holiday, you know, update or, you know, mm-hmm. kind of, and of course with COVID, you know, it was a little, it wasn't all, you know, happiness and we're going to be great. But, you know, I, I suggested, you know, Okay, this Christmas, you know, this holiday season, go to, you know, if you have a, an elderly neighbor that lives by themselves, that's going to be doing Christmas by themselves, take a walk over there, leave them a little card or a basket of cookies, something just as small and simple as that, can change a, piece, a person's day. Yeah. And you sure got to you get so many people who are, have been homebound for so long. Mm-hmm. And they need to know that there's an outside world out there, and we care about you. I want to end this cast 
on on one mm-hmm. note. Um, we talked about some heavy issues. Tell me a story that you've experienced during your legislation careers uh, that you know from the community, something that inspired you to continue on because you deal with a lot, and it's it's got to be mentally draining to fight every single day. Um, and see some of the things that you that you witness. Um, what what keeps Christine Sinicki, uh putting one foot in front of the other one and really still going forward? Oh, that that is a tough one. There's, there's so many stories that I could share with you. Um, gosh, let me see. I can answer your story. It's not my story. It's the story of the legislature, and it's it, and it. No, you know what? I'm going to share with you. I'm sorry. I am going to share with you something from my middle school years, my junior high school years, that I, you know, cause I always believe that who you are is shaped by your experiences growing up. Absolutely. So, you know, so I'm 61 years old, and in the 1970s, I was in junior high school. Um, most of you probably know it as middle school now. <laughs> um, and back then, there were there were issues that, that we just never talked about. Uh, and one of those issues was um, LG, LGBTQ issues. You know, nobody ever wanted, nobody talked about it. Mm-hmm. I had two of my classmates kill themselves. Because they were gay and they had no result. No one to talk to. Um, when I got onto the office, one of the very first things, resolutions that I pushed was to, um, fund counselors at every single school, uh, that were qualified to talk to children about this. Um, so I think that helped, helped to shape my, my world and the other thing and this is a more recent story and it just popped into my head it's kind of on the same vein i'm sure you all remember a few years ago when there was a big discussion about uh transgender children Mm -hmm. and um you know this big debate about where they go to the bathroom well at that time i was on the assembly education committee and there was a bill we called it the bathroom bill because it was basically, you know, telling transgender kids where they can and cannot go to the bathroom. It was a long hearing and child, child after child testified. And the speaker, Robin Boss, he said, this is enough. We're shutting it down. So they basically shut it down and uh, made everybody leave the Capitol. Now, this is like six o'clock at night. Mm. And so for one of the things as a legislature, I control what happens in my own office. Mm-hmm. So there was this one young man who did not get a chance to testify. And I could see how upset he was. So I went up to him. I said, come on. Uh, I want you to come to my office, and I want to hear what you what you have to say. I want to hear your story. Oh, my God. Oh, well, this this poor young man, uh, trans, tried, he was 14 years old, tried to kill himself seven times. Hmm. Seven times. And all I could do at that point, I mean, I had no words for him. All I could do was just kind of like fold him up into my arms and give him a hug mm-hmm. and tell him there are people that care about him. I, you know, the thing that I hear is that you're bringing the thing that's important to you has been bringing a face to politics and bringing an empathetic human approach to politics and being able to make that difference in your community. Is that? Thank you. That that is probably one of the nicest things anybody's ever said about me. Thank you. (laughs) You're welcome. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's important that people realize we're not all in it for money and power. Right. I'm in it because I care. I care about people. And that's important for my listeners to hear. 
I think that's really Thank important you. for many of us to hear from people like yourself. Um, Thank you. That human component, I feel that most of us feel somehow m- disappears when you enter the political arena. And it's so refreshing it to hear. To yeah, it's so refreshing to hear that that at least is still alive in your office. Thank you. And I would just I I would tell your listeners to ever have you know you, you have an issue you want to share something with me. My door is always open. I don't care if you're a constituent or not. I know that I. I appreciated that because I had nowhere else to reach out and it was amazing. Um, it's, it's hard to find a human in politics. I know. Cause I looked, um, the only one that I found that even fit a bill close to close to anything has been yourself. And, um, oh, thank you. the network that I've created, uh, in terms of the people that I've met through you and then through my own journey has been invaluable. Um, you know, one of the things that I said is I need to find a positive outlet to to express what I've went through, have a voice somehow, and try to make some kind of positive change out of this horrible situation that I went through. Mm-hmm. Helping others um, is a really healing thing, and being able to be a part of an effort and a movement that creates positive change um, is really healing for a lot of people. And so people that are, are suffering or have suffered, uh, you know, at some aspect of, of the system, support the cause, put yourself into some kind of, pl- uh, positive, uh, community aspect so that you're giving and, and it just creates a healing, uh, that I've, been able to walk away from some of this in a much better uh, way than I would have ever imagined as a result of just the positive experiences that I've made with the members of the community. Well, well I, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, you, okay, I've only met you one time. And when I met you that one time, you are, I can tell just in your voice that you're in a better place. Um, I'm glad. But, um, well, it, it it's that um, the steps of of recovery for me were, you know, realizing the situation because for me, mm-hmm. my you know for my listeners, I had medical malpractice as an issue, and and there was a lot of cracks in the system that I fell in mm-hmm. that I couldn't find any help, which are still ongoing. Right. Um, but being able to become a part of a process to help make change to help spread awareness and to make some kind of positive out of such a tragic tragedy um, for me is the healing aspect. And I think that's what got me to where I'm at. Um, And that's why I encourage others, you know, if if you can somehow turn uh, an adversity into a positive and try to, you know, make a positive change in your community, in my opinion, that's one of the Mm -hmm. best ways to heal and one of the best ways to, to accelerate change within our community. So good for you. Yeah. yeah I, uh, I appreciate yeah. you. Um, I continue to vote for you. I continue to support you. And I really look forward to our round table with Steve and, and Wade, um, discussing some of these issues yeah. in, in further depth. Um, yeah. it's great that, that we're, that you've created a team and that, that we're proactively, uh, continuing to work on some of these large issues and yeah so thank you for your part in that <laughs> well no thank you for, for yeah thank you for for giving me this platform to talk about it too appreciate it i look forward to uh when we're all together with steve and, and wade and you and i sounds great so. well i wish you a great okay. day christine and thank you very you much too. for your time today okay okay thanks both. Take care. bye now